As I say, we are very pleased to have Stephen Carter with us tonight. Uh, you probably already know he's a law professor from Yale University. He is the author of uh, seven nonfiction books. This is his second fiction book. But the thing about Stephen Carter in writing fiction is he writes it in a way that he he makes you think. It was the, uh, the Washington Post that said, uh, like a modern-day version of a sociologist, Carter casts a critical light on the lifestyles of the black and privileged. He tackles issues in a non-fiction, or rather in a, a uh, fiction genre. So please join me in welcoming Stephen L. Carter. Well, thank you for that kind introduction, and thank you all for uh, coming out here tonight. It's, uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be here. It's a pleasure, actually, to be back uh, in Atlanta. I, um, my family moved to Atlanta when I was in college, so I never actually lived here, although I did work here a couple of, uh, of summers. I have family here. I have uh, uh, two brothers uh, who, uh, who uh, live here. Um, one of them with his wife and family, and they're happily here uh, uh, with us uh, tonight. Um, and so it's a joy to be back. It's also a joy, frankly, uh, to be on book tour again. I haven't done a book tour in five years. That's the longest I've ever gone without, uh, that, without a book tour since I started writing. I didn't know how long it would take me to finish this book, but it's especially delightful to be on a book tour for a novel. As some of you may know, of the several books I've written, most of them are nonfiction. I wrote um, seven nonfiction books before I ever uh, turned to fiction. So this is actually my ninth uh, book tour. And I want to tell you, it's very different to go on a book tour for nonfiction uh, than it is for fiction, especially the kind of nonfiction that I write, which is my sister-in-law who's here tonight, says is uh, the everybody's entitled to my opinion uh, <laughs> kind of book. You know, so for example, I, I've written three books about religion and politics. When you write a book about religion and politics, when you go to a book signing, several things happen. The first thing is there's only about six people uh, in the audience. The second thing is they're all really angry. Now, they're not angry at me. They probably never heard of me. They certainly haven't read the book. But they heard somebody was going to be talking about religion and politics, and they're angry about that. And so no matter what I say, no matter what I read, every question begins the same way. Professor Carter, I'm sure you would agree with me that, and then they make their speech, the one they came there to give. And as soon as I say, being a law professor, as soon as I begin by saying, well, it's a little more complicated issue than that, they get up and storm out so that in a few minutes, <laughs> the signing is over, and, that's, and none of them uh, bought the book. And, and so then you do a signing for a novel, and the nice thing is people who come there are mostly happy. You know, they've read the novel, they're looking forward to reading the novel. It's not the novel's perfect. Some people probably hated it, but why would they spend an hour listening to the author uh, reading and talking about, uh, about so the people who come are the people who are on my side, and that's, uh, and, and that's a nice uh, uh, change. I, I uh, want to say also what a special joy it is to be in the uh, Carter Center. One of my memories of uh, when I... Uh, first came to Atlanta, one of my summer jobs, I was a summer reporter for the, what was then the Atlanta Journal back in the summer of 1976. I was just out of college. And that, of course, is the summer that Jimmy Carter was getting ready to run, was running for president. And so I would sit there uh, in the office of the newspaper, calling people on the phone to interview them for one story or another. And almost invariably, uh, they would say to me, are you any kin to Jimmy? They would say... <laughs> And, you know, they couldn't see me, you know. And, and, and so uh, after a while, I developed the right answer to that, which is, well, not very close relations <laughs> is, what I would, uh, is what I would say. Anyway, it is a pleasure to be here, and I would thank you all uh, for coming. What I'm going to do tonight, I'm going to do a, a small amount of talking, uh, some reading from my new novel, a little more talking, a little more reading, and uh, then I'm going to answer some of the more commonly asked questions about the novel. And then after that, I'll be happy to answer any questions that any of you uh, might have. Uh, in order to read a little bit, let me try to situate us a little bit in, in the story. I, some of you probably read 
my first novel, The Emperor of Ocean Park. And The Emperor of Ocean Park, and if you haven't read it, you could, it, it, it's not, this isn't a follow-on novel, it's, but, but there's a connection that I want to mention. The Emperor of Ocean Park took place um, mainly in a fictitious college town uh, called Elm Harbor, and it involved an unnamed university. And as New England White begins, we're back in Elm Harbor, and we're back near that university. Now, the narrator of the Emperor of Ocean Park was a law professor named Misha Garland, Talcott Garland, his name was Misha. And New England White uh, largely follows a family who were minor characters in that first novel. That's the family of Lamaster and Julia Carlyle. Um, Julia Carlyle, I think, had one scene in the Emperor of Ocean Park and no lines. And Lamaster Carlyle, I think, had uh, three scenes and just a few lines. But Misha Garland, looking at them in the Ambrosian Park, looks at them through the eyes of envy. He tells us that Lamaster is perfect, that his marriage is perfect, that his children are perfect, that his wife is perfect. He used the word perfect several times, describing them, even though they're very minor characters. And so for me, as a writer who loves character, <clears throat> naturally the first thing I'm drawn to do in writing a new novel is to think about what would that seemingly outwardly perfect family really be like? What strains might exist beneath the surface? And how might those strains be brought to the front if the couple were enmeshed in a kind of mystery uh, that dragged them perhaps unwillingly from one situation to another? And that was the genesis, I suppose, of New England White. Now, in New England White, the story begins with a prologue, which I'm not going to read tonight, but, but the prologue establishes a few things. The prologue tells us that we're back in this town again. Uh, it's through the prologue uh, that we learn that the Carlisle family, they're African Americans, don't actually live in the town of Elm Harbor, the college town where much of the action is set. They live in a suburb of Elm Harbor, and the name of the suburb is Tyler's Landing. Uh, the name of the suburb is Tyler's Landing, and the, the residents sometimes just call it The Landing uh, for short. I'm going to read you part of Chapter 1, but before we begin, uh, I should tell you a couple of other things to make a couple of story points clear. The first is that uh, Lamaster Carlyle, the man that, uh, who's described by uh, the narrator of the Emperor Ocean Park as perfect, uh, has recently been named president of the university. The second thing I need to tell you is that the Carlyles uh, have four children, one of whom, their teenage daughter Vanessa, you would learn in the prologue, nine months ago, for reasons that are unclear, uh, burned her father's car on the town green and has been under a psychiatrist's care ever since that happened. The other thing you need to know is that Julia and Lamaster have nicknames for each other. Lamaster calls his wife Jules and she calls him Lemmy. Now, with that as background, let me read from chapter one of, the, uh, of uh, New England White. Uh, on Friday, the cat disappeared, the White House phoned, and Jeannie's fever said the sitter when Julia called from the echoing marble lobby of Lombard Hall, where she and her husband were fetting shadowy alumni one or two facing indictment whose only virtue was piles of money. Jeannie's fever hit 103. After that, things got worse or faster, as her grandmother used to say, although Granny V's Harlem locutions shaped to the rhythm of an era when the race possessed a stylish sense of humor about itself, would not have gone over well in the landing, and Julia Carlyle had long schooled herself to avoid them. The cat was the smallest problem, even if later it turned out to be a portent. Rainbow Coalition, the children's smelly feline mutt, had vanished before and usually came back, but now and then stayed away and was dutifully replaced by another dreadful creature of the same name. The White House was another matter. Lamaster's college roommate, now residing in the Oval Office, telephoned at least once a month, usually to shoot the breeze, a thing it had never before occurred to Julia that presidents of the United States did. As to Jeannie, well, the child was a solid eight years into a feverish childhood, the youngest of four. 
And her mother knew by now not to rush home at each spike of the thermometer. Tylenol and cool compresses had so far defeated every virus that had dared attack her child and would stymie this one, too. Julia gave the sitter her marching orders and returned to the endless dinner in time for the master's closing jokes. It was 11 minutes before 10 on the second Friday in November in the year of our Lord, 2003. Outside Lombard Hall, the snow had arrived early, two inches on the ground and more expected. As the police would later reconstruct the night's events, Professor Kellen Zant was already dead and on the way to town in his car. That's the beginning of chapter one. And uh, as the story goes on, Lamaster and Julia leave the dinner, which is on campus, to drive home uh, to their little New England town of Tyler's Landing. And on the way, they have a brief argument over Vanessa and the course of her treatment uh, and so on. And then uh, Lamaster is just getting ready to tell his wife about an interesting telephone call that he received the other day when the car runs off the road. And just before the car ran off the road, I should have mentioned that um, Lamaster Carlyle, the stern traditionalist, seen as perfect from the outside, he has a secret musical taste. And while they're driving home, they're listening to a group called Goody Mob, which is at the very hard end of the rather hard spectrum of hip hop uh, uh, music, listening to it cranked up very loud. Julia, you understand, prefers Broadway show tunes, but <laughs> Lamaster is of a different taste. So the car runs off the road, and so our story continues. Every New Englander knows that nighttime snowy woods are noisy. Chittering, sneaking animals, whistling, teasing wind, crackling, creaking branches. There is plenty to hear except when your Escalade is in a ditch, the engine hissing and missing, hissing and missing, and goody mob still yellowing from nine speakers. <laughs> Julia pried herself from behind the airbag, her husband's outstretched hand ready to help. Shivering, she looked up and down the indentation in the snow that marked Four Mile Road. Lamaster had his hands on her face, Confused, she, sl she slapped them away. He patiently turned her back to look at him. She realized that he was asking if she was all right. There was blood on his forehead and in his mouth, a lot of it. Her turn to ask how he was doing and his turn to reassure her. No cell phone service out here. They both tried. What do we do now? Said Julia, shivering for any number of good reasons. She tried to decide whether to be angry at him for taking his eyes off the road just before a sharp bend that had not budged in their six years of living out here. We wait for the next car to come by. Nobody drives this way but you. Lamaster was out of the ditch up on the road. We drove ten minutes and passed two cars. Another one will be along in a bit. He paused and for a wretched moment she feared he might be calculating the precise moment when the next was expected. We'll leave the headlights on. The next car will see us and slow down. His voice was calm, as calm as the day the president asked him to come down to Washington and, as a pillar of integrity, clean up the latest mess in the White House. As calm as the night two decades ago when Julia told him she was pregnant and he answered without excitement or reproach that they must marry. Moral life, Lamaster often said, required reason more than passion. Maybe so but too much reason could drive you nuts. You should wait in the car. This is Lamaster talking again. It's cold out here. Julia, uncertain, did as her husband suggested. He was eight years her senior, a difference that had once provided her a certain assurance, but in recent years it left her feeling more and more that he treated her like a child. Granny V used to say that if you married a man because you wanted him to take care of you, you ran the risk that he would. About to climb into the warmth of the car, she spotted by moonlight a ragged bundle in the ditch a few yards away. She took half a step toward it, and a pair of feral creatures with glowing eyes jerked furry heads up from their meal and scurried into the trees. A deer, she decided, the dark mound mostly covered with snow, probably struck by a car and thrown into the ditch, transformed into dinner for whatever animals refused to hibernate. Shivering, she buttoned her coat then turned back toward the Escalade. 
She did not need a close look at some blood-stained animal with the most succulent pieces missing. Only once she had her hand on the door handle did she stop. Deer, she reminded herself, rarely wear shoes. <laughs> she swallowed an unexpected lump in her throat. Lemmy. But her determined husband was up in the road, waiting calmly to flag down the next car, even if it took till spring. <laughs> Lemmy. He was at her side in an instant. He could do that. Lamaster was madly in love, her friend Tessa used to say, with his own reliability. <laughs> What's wrong, Jules? I thought it was a deer, but there's a body over there. She pointed. He followed her finger, then strolled through the ditch to take a look. Don't touch it, she said, because he was already kneeling, brushing snow from the face, probably ruining the crime scene, at least from what she heard on CSI, to which she was addicted. She waited, sitting half in the car with the door open, the airbag blocking her access to the radio, which she really wanted to shut off. Lamaster returned, a narrow face grim. It's not a deer, he said, almost consolingly, small, strong hand on her shoulder. It's a man. And the animals have been, well, you know. Julia waited, reading in his face that this was not the real point her husband wanted to make. At last, he sagged. Jules, we know him. So the dead man, the body they found, turns out to be Kellen Zant. Kellen Zant is a prominent economist. He's a member of the university faculty. He's also African-American. And that discovery takes place on Friday night. On Saturday morning, they're visited at home by detectives who keep them for a while asking a lot of questions. And toward the end of the questions, as the detectives are preparing to leave, something happens. A signal passed between the detectives. Oh, yes, we almost forgot. One more thing. Would you, Mrs. Carlyle, be able to characterize for us your relationship with the decedent? relationship. Weren't you once close and personal friends? A speechless moment, only the detectives able to make eye contact with anybody else in the room. History piled up behind her, thick and strong. She recalled a face of quite seductive jolliness, a sparkling delight focused on her alone. Yes, we were briefly, but that was before my marriage. Can you tell us when you talked to him last? as much as saying they did not believe her. We have a busy day, gentlemen, Lamaster said, and her appreciation of him quickened and felt like love. They sorried and thanked their way out the door. So now the detectives have departed, leaving behind the uneasy truth that they know what perhaps Julia thought they didn't know, that the man who is dead, the man who was found in the road, and he turns out to have been shot, by the way, had once long ago been her boyfriend, as she said, before my marriage, she said. Indeed, she sometimes says that Lamaster rescued her because her relationship with Kellen Zant, whom she had met when she was an undergraduate and he was a graduate student, while in many ways terrifically exciting, had also been for her enormously destructive. Well, in due course, uh, Julia goes to Kellen Zant's funeral. Now, Julia, as she herself tells us in the book, is from a family that's been architects for seven generations. And yes, there were uh, African-American architects in America back at the time of the Revolutionary War, so it's entirely plausible that this could be true. Kellen Zant, on the other hand, is from a different side of the tracks. He grew up in Arkadelphia, Arkansas. He grew up quite poor. No one in his family had ever had much formal education. And Julia goes down to Arkadelphia for the funeral. She's accompanied by her 17-year-old daughter, Vanessa, the daughter who is troubled. And at the funeral, she encounters a woman named Mary. 
Mary Mallard. And Mary Mallard, by her own description, is a conspiracy theorist. She likes to write books about who really killed JFK and things like that. And quite naturally, Julia is confused about what a conspiracy theorist is doing at Kellen Zant's funeral in Arkadelphia, Arkansas. And Mary tells her that she was working on a project with Kellen and that Kellen left something for her and said he would leave it with Julia. And could she have it, please? And Julia has no idea what she's talking about. Subsequently, the funeral ends and Julia and her daughter leave the funeral. And so the story continues. From the cemetery, Julia and Vanessa made their way to a lovely Victorian bed and breakfast on North 10th Street to shower and change in a room of Versailles-like proportions so sparsely but tastefully furnished it was like being outdoors. Vanessa enthused over the gold leaf on the beveled bathroom mirror, and Julia's practiced eye labeled it 19th century Louis XVI style, probably made by hand in New Orleans and certainly worth a bit of money. For a moment, she thought of offering to buy it, for antiques were her fifth or sixth love, and she knew quality. The gilding was directly on the glass, a rarely seen process known as eglomise, and the mirror included a transparent panel at the top with another gilded design painted inside. Sometimes life with Lamaster felt like gilding on glass, too. The rest of the clan envied her perfect marriage, but Julia knew its slick, shining fragility. She peered closer. Mirrors were her thing. Granny V bought them everywhere she went, and the collection in her Edgecombe Avenue mansion had once been the pride of Harlem, but most of them wound up in France with Julia's mother, who sold them piece by piece, along with anything else of value she could put her hands on, in order to write checks to organizations pledging to end war, poverty, ignorance, oppression, and hatred, preferably by next month. Julia ran her fingers along the filigree, wondering absurdly if the intricate scroll work might conceal a microphone. She had no idea why she was thinking this way. Mary Mallard must really have spooked her. Remembering her purpose, she asked Vanessa what she and the other kids had been talking about. Oh, you know, she said, just old stories. Stories about Professor Zant, about the college down here and stuff, history. They have really cool traditions and everything, ghosts, this killer tornado a few years ago, famous battles, stuff like that. Did you know they evacuated the whole town in the Civil War? To which Julia responds, probably just the white people. Julia's next question came out nervously because the Klan taught the presentation of the family to the world as perfection. You didn't tell them about Gina. Vanessa crinkled her nose and grinned. Oh, moms, come on. You know how Gina hates when I talk about her. Right. Right, so you've said. Both returned to their dressing, the daughter serenely, the mother uneasily. Julia dared not say more. She and Vanessa quarreled constantly, as adolescent girls and their mothers do, and Julia reveled in these rare moments of peace. Gina Jewell, according to one theory, was the cause of Vanessa's peculiar mania. The other view held that Vanessa's obsession with Gina was only a symbol, a sort of Jungian manifestation of a deeper trauma. Gina was 17 like Vanessa, a resident of the landing also like Vanessa, and her father like Vanessa's taught at the university. As a matter of fact, Merrill Jewell had been the beloved dean of the Divinity School, another connection. Gina was a shy, creative child, as Vanessa was, her only true experience with the opposite sex having begun in the fall of her 11th grade year, that is about the time Vanessa had her own first date. She had Vanessa's height, moderate smile, and slightly gangly grace, for Vanessa kept an enlargement of a newspaper photograph of Gina atop her dresser until Dr. Brady urged her, Julia begged her, and Lamaster ordered her to take it down. Whenever Vanessa unexpectedly vanished for an hour or two, she would explain that Gina needed her and leave it at that. True, Gina was white, and Julia had never forgotten her mother's dictum about finding her children black friends. Gina's skin color, however, was very far from being the largest problem in the friendship between the two girls. No, the largest problem was that Merrill Jewell had been in the ground a good quarter century, and his daughter Gina had drowned at the town beach back when a stamp cost eight cents, Cokes were a dime, and Leonid Brezhnev ran the Soviet Union. So Vanessa, Julia's daughter, the one who burned the car nine months ago, talks to Gina, who drowned at the town beach 30, 
years ago. And again, nobody knows quite why. And as the story develops, that's all the reason, that the reading part I'm going to do, but as the story develops, what we discover is that the teenage white girl who died at, the t at Town Beach 30 years ago was also thought to be murdered. And the young man who was suspected of her murder, who was later killed, was a young black teenager. We also discover, discover is too strong a word, we also find that Julia sees the murder of Gina 30 years ago as an obsession, a problem suddenly dealt with in therapy by her daughter. And she sees the murder of Kellen Zant, her ex-boyfriend, as something she wants no part of. She doesn't want to investigate. She doesn't know what really happened. That's a part of her life. She's drawn a line and put that behind her. But quite unwillingly, as time goes on, she's drawn into worrying that there might be a connection between these two murders, the one 30 years ago and the one that just happened. And more than that, she's drawn into wondering if that connection, whatever it is, might be related to, let us say, national politics. And on that note, I think I should not tell you anything else about the book, <laughs> but let you read it for yourselves. Before I, ask, before I go to your questions, though, I want to answer some of the most frequently asked questions about the book, and two of them in particular. Um, one question I'm very frequently asked is, Two-thirds to three-quarters of this book is told from Julia Carlyle's point of view. And so people ask me, was it difficult uh, to write from the point of view of a woman? And the answer is yes. Of course it was difficult to write from the point of view of a woman. But, you know, writing The Emperor of Ocean Park wasn't easy either. That is, my first novel, because it's written in the first person, the narrator was a law professor, people think that was easy. He was just channeling himself. Now, my wife, who's smiling in the very back row there, uh, I hope would say to you that I'm nothing like the Misha Garland narrator, well, except for the things you might have liked about him, but the things you didn't like about him, that's not true of me, I hope she would say. Seriously, the point is that Misha was an invention also, and a difficult voice to sustain, because it's a voice unlike my own. And yes, Julia's an invention, and a difficult voice to sustain, but I think that all fiction that you take it all seriously should be like that. The voice should be difficult to sustain. Otherwise, you fall into this world where men can only write men, women can only write women, black people can only write black people, white people can only write white people, and so on and so on. And I think the whole project of human communication runs against that. I think as long as we're aided by a serious streak of empathy, we should be able to write and create from lots of different points of view. The other thing I should tell you about Julia as the major character is Julia didn't begin as the major character. I thought I'd be telling the story from a number of different points of view, but as the story evolved, more and more of it seemed to flow logically through her. There were other scenes and other characters who were needed, and after a while I almost threw up my hands and as much as said to myself, I might as well just make it mainly Julia's story. That's simply the easiest way at this point uh, to tell it. And for those of you who may have read the book, this won't give anything away for those who haven't. So you might say, well, there's a little joke in there about whether a man can write from one's point of view. Was that an intentional joke? Of course it was an intentional joke. <laughs> so another question um, that I often get is why did it take me so long? Because during those, you know, The Emperor of Ocean Park was published in 2002. And for the last five years, I've gotten a lot of what were initially encouraging letters and emails. You know, I really liked your book, that kind of thing. I hope we can see a new one soon. And then I think the same people, you know, started writing again a year or so later. Where's that book? You know? And it, it got very demanding. It was like, a, after a while, like having a bill collector, you know, and so I had to do it. But why did it take so long? Well, I think. For me, it's not true of everyone, writing fiction is much harder than writing nonfiction, much harder. When I write nonfiction, whether I'm writing a book or an article for a scholarly journal, an op-ed, I know what I'm doing. I make an outline, and I expand the outline, and I'm finished. It's, straight, it's not easy, but it's straightforward. And when I write a novel, 
and I've written, I've published two novels. I have another one that's coming out next summer. And when I write a novel, um, I write an outline. I begin with characters that I want to tell a story about. I usually write an epilogue and a prologue and a couple of scenes so I can try to think of what the story's about. And then I write a story, usually in prose form, but it serves as an outline. And then I try to write it, and it's just really hard. I find it's very difficult for me to stick to the outline. You know, the characters, people talk about this, develop in unexpected ways. It's not that they take over the story, but that, you know, I might have Julia doing something in Chapter 8, but the way I developed her in Chapter 4, she wouldn't really do that anymore. It gets very complex for me that way. And that's part of the problem I should add as a footnote. Obviously, not every novelist has that problem. There are novels which are very readable novels every year. Um, I don't seem to have that talent. And I... My wife and Noel and I were once at a, a book signing of uh, a, a book talk and signing uh, by a, a black woman who's a novelist, and she mentioned something about, you know, talk about her outline, so I raised my hand like a fool, and, and I said in the question and answer period, I said, do you ever find that when you are writing that the characters kind of get away from you? It's as though they, it doesn't fit. You've got to redo the outline because they're up to things you didn't expect. And she said, No. <laughs> I think that's why some people can turn novels out and other people, uh, other people can't. The other, the other reason I, I find that there's something else which my wife would also tell you. Writing fiction is a very obsessive act for me. There's a part of me that's always obsessive about writing. I love writing. I love putting words together. I love the English language. I love things it can do. I write with a dictionary and a thesaurus because I like to learn new words. I write with, on, to, on my left, on my bookshelf is... Uh, Dictionary of American Slang, and on the big bookshelf on the other side of my study is Dictionary of American Regional English, which is a multi-volume set, which I highly recommend to you. I, I use these things. I love to use them. I, I just, the English language fascinates me. I've loved it since I was a small child. I love writing. And somehow, when I write fiction, um, that love becomes, you know, obsessive and unhealthy, <laughs> you know, so that somehow I can't stop. You know, I, I just am constantly, people say, how do you go with those phrases? Constantly polishing and polishing. Like when I was reading chapter one after the car crashed, you know, chittering, sneaking animals. You have no idea how many days. <laughs> yes, days it took me to come up with chittering, sneaking and I like the way it sounds. But I'm not like, you know, people like John Updike and Toni Morris, you know, they throw the pen up, it comes down and chittering, sneaking animals, you know. And, and for, you know, I just got to sit and worry and obsess and worry and obsess. And you know, they say that every artist should have somebody who stands behind him and hits him over the head when, when he doesn't need to put another brush stroke on the painting. And so my wife kind of serves that, that for me when I write. She tries to stop me when I'm really going overboard. Um, she says, you really got to stop and turn this loose. And she, she says, let me read it. And so I do. And because and, she reads everything um, pretty much before my editor does. And she'll tell me if it's no good. And actually, that's very important because my wife is not, doesn't read fiction. She reads nonfiction. She reads a lot of nonfiction. But she doesn't read much fiction. And, and so it's got to please her as someone who's not a, really a fiction uh, uh, reader. And sometimes the editor will call and say, where's that manuscript you were going to email me today? I say, my wife vetoed it. I couldn't, uh, I, I, I couldn't send it. So without a NOLA, I, I'm, I'm not sure I'd be able to stop, number one. I, I'm not sure how good it would be either because she saves me from many um, wrong uh, uh, choices. Nevertheless, I think it's that obsessive aspect of the writing that makes me take so much longer to turn out fiction uh, than nonfiction. So now I've got this one. I have another one coming out next year. So we'll see if that one's any good. And uh, and if it is, maybe I'll be able to write them a little bit uh, uh, faster. We'll see if I keep on writing them. Because that's the other problem. You know, I'm a law professor. I've got a day job. I really believe in that job. I love teaching my students. I can hardly wait to get back in the classroom. I love the give and take of the world of legal scholarship. And my wife tells me that she doesn't know how much longer I can go on trying to do both of these things because it costs things like you know rest and sleep and things like that. And maybe she's right. Maybe it's someone else to make a choice. Um, she's a very wise woman, but um, I don't want to make a choice. I, I love them both so much. I hate to think of having to give up one or the other of of these uh, lives, even though they do keep me uh, very very busy. Anyway, let me stop there with what I have to say. Let me take any questions that any of you. Um, uh, might have. And since I have a microphone and you don't, uh, maybe I'll repeat the questions or, being a law professor, I'll exercise my prerogative to rephrase the question <laughs> so that I can answer the question I wish that you asked uh, instead. <laughs> so, any questions? Yes, ma'am. Is it hard to go back to writing nonfiction? 
is it hard to go back to writing nonfiction? Well, it's not that it's hard. It's that it is a little bit different, though. It's interesting. Um, I'll tell you a little story. Uh, I wrote a book, oh, goodness, 13 years ago. I published a book. It sold about six copies. It was called The Confirmation Mess. It was about the federal appointments process and the confirmation of judges and justices and cabinet officials and things like that. So about three years ago, maybe four, three or four years ago, I was, I was invited to a symposium um, at the University of Iowa on the confirmation process. And, you know, at a symposium, a bunch of scholars get together and they give papers. And so after accepting the invitation, I had to think of what to write my paper about, about the federal confirmation process. And I sat there puzzling, and I started writing, and it ended up being fiction. That is, I kind of I wrote a story. <laughs> no, I did. I mean, I was trying to make a point, you know, but I wrote this story in which I was making these what I thought were clever legal points that probably weren't very clever, probably wasn't a very clever story. But the point is I wrote this story, and that's what, what got published in the Iowa Law Review, was this, uh, this story that I wrote uh, that had these aspects of the federal confirmation process uh, in it. And it's not that that's all that I do, but I think if I'd never written and published a novel, that would never even occur to me as something um, uh, to do. I will say one thing, though. There's one trend that does worry me. I have found that since I started writing fiction, I obsess a little more about my nonfiction. I obsess a little more about the writing. And uh, in fact, um, I missed one important deadline. I couldn't publish a paper that I'd labored long and hard on because even after it got edited and they were ready to go, I was still saying, well, it's not ready. I was obsessing over the writing and changing things uh, uh, around and, uh, and so on. But I do have some nonfiction projects I'm looking forward to getting back to and I'm very excited about. Um, I'm working on a book about just and unjust wars that I've been writing for a very long time. That's not so interesting. Everybody's writing one of those um, uh, these days. But, but I'm also, um, I'm writing a book about why books are important, not why reading is important. There are a lot of books about reading is important, and I agree with the thesis of those books. But why physical books that you hold in your hand are important, things they symbolize, the meaning of something that is transmitted in this form versus some other form. I'm not um, a technophobe. I'm not against other things. I'm not anti-internet or anything like that. Um, but I do think there's a, a particular niche, especially a democracy that's filled by books. And I won't bore you with the whole story here. I gave a lecture on that at the Library of Congress a few years ago that I'm hoping to turn into um, a, a short uh, book. And that's near to, to my heart. Other questions? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I well, I, I I appreciate that comment. Let me let me say a couple of things. Um, and I should emphasize I, this is not. It, it is true that in my first two novels, the main characters have been well-to-do African Americans from families of a certain tradition of of um, college degrees and professional life and so on. I don't want to claim that's all the point of views I'm ever going to use. I'm sorry, all the points of view I'm ever going to use in my, um, in my writing. But I agree with the thrust of your question. And in fact, um, one, of the th one of the reasons I think I do it, uh, aside from the fact it's just I thought it would be fun, um, is that, you know, 
when you think about 300 years of slavery and 100 years of Jim Crow and a lot of other problems and oppression since then, that there are families that managed against the odds over that period to maintain a certain tradition of achievement and so on that was not available to everybody by any means, but available to some, and some were able to take advantage of it, I think that's something to be celebrated. It's a, it is a remarkable story, so I agree with you, and I'm, I thank you for your uh, comment. Other questions? There's someone over here who I had one a moment ago. I'll take yours, and then I'll come up here. Yes, go ahead. What compelled me from an academic background to um, write uh, fiction? Compelled is a good word, uh, by the way. Uh, you know, I probably wrote fiction before I wrote nonfiction. When I was a little kid. Um, my older brothers here could tell you the stories. Probably I used to buy these little night notebooks and I'd fill them with my little stories, as I um, uh, as I called them. Um, I always wanted to write. I always, of all the different things I did, even at school, say the writing was the thing that I always enjoyed. Um, uh, the most, and the desire to write fiction, to create characters and so on, has always been with me. Before I was a law professor, when I first graduated law school in the late 70s and lived in Washington, I began back then to, the ideas began to percolate in my head of what would it be like as I began to discover this community of well-to-do African-American families in Upper Northwest Washington, D.C., something I really hadn't known anything about before that, I began to imagine uh, characters, settings there in which I might set a mystery. And I probably had some of those characters to kick you around my head for 20 years before I was finally able to come up with a story and the time to put one together. I cannot tell you why that moment. I can only tell you that things came together, the story, the characters, the time to do it. Um, and I'm haunted by characters, even now. Um, New England White isn't the only novel I worked on in the last few years. I tried out several versions of different characters from the Upper Ocean Park I wanted to write about and write about their lives and so on, and the rest of them just weren't good. I mean, this one worked out better. This was, this was the one that was able to be polished and worked into something that was um, ultimately going to be, be publishable. Um, and I have other characters I want to write about. The novel that's coming out next summer, a little bit of a departure. It's still a mystery, but it's a... Um, I guess you call it historical fiction. It begins in the 1950s. It begins, in fact, in the first sentence of chapter one, Browning's Board of Education is decided. And it ends 20 years later, about the time that Nixon resigns. And I think of this, that's the 60s to me. The 60s begin with Brown and end with Nixon. That, um, arithmetic was not my best subject, but so I can do that. <laughs> but, but that's the 60s to me. Uh, and we do meet some of the characters from both the Amber Ocean Park and New England White when they were younger. We meet them in that uh, story. So, for example, um, uh, the, remember the first sentence of the prologue of the Amber Ocean Park begins when my father finally died. Some of you may have read it, you might remember that. Well, in the novel that's coming out next summer, um, Oliver Garland is alive as a young lawyer in New York. Um, when the book begins in the 1950s. And some of the other, other characters, they're not, they're not the major characters in the book, but some, of the, but, they are, but some of them have appearances as minor characters in that, um, uh, in that story. Again, I'm, I'm just haunted by characters. And there are, I have a head full of characters and a laptop full of characters. Some of them made into these books. Some of them haven't made it onto the page yet, but who I really want to uh, write about. There's this, um, this woman who is a chess player, and she's half West Indian and half Russian, and she grew up with her aunt in New York, and I, no, I just made all that up, you understand, but the point is I want to write about her. I, this is someone, I, I, I have stories I want to tell, but someone's in my head, and I've got, I want to talk about her and her story. I have these characters, but, you know, you've got to come up with a story to fit the character that's a, a reasonable, reasonable story. So that's, so go back to, so I answered the question I wish to ask instead, but as to, all I can say about how I, how I turn to it, the word you was compel, and compel is the only word I can think of because I'm haunted by these characters and I need to uh, let them out. There was a hand in the front I said it would take. Yes, ma'am. Well, two questions. One is, how, I mean, how did you decide on the mystery genre and where does the grandmother come from in your book? Because it comes back to that. How did I, how did I decide on the mystery genre and uh, where did the grandmother come from? Yeah, you know, I, I was at a, 
throughout the, the novel, New England White, um, Julia frequently remembers the wisdom of her grandmother, Granny V. Uh, there's several times Granny V once said, you've heard two of them already in just what I read, the, the few little pages I read here. I was at a book signing where someone told me he's collected, that he wrote down all the wisdom of Granny V from the... Uh, I don't know how I decided on her. She just seemed like a really good character. Um, her name is Amaretta Vizi. I think she's only named once in the story. And uh, um, she is of the Vizis who once were part of Vizi and Eldon, the largest firm of black architects in America. I made that up in the story, but that's who she was. She lived in Harlem and had a daughter, Mona. Her daughter, Mona, had twins, Julia and her twin brother, um, and raised them in Hanover, New Hampshire. Um, for reasons that we don't even need to go into. I just, it, I, I like the idea, I'll tell you something. Um, I, I like the idea of doing it, but I'll tell you something else about her. I, I really, really deeply believe in the tradition um, of the respect that's due to age and of the wisdom that people accumulate over the years. We live in a culture today that's so youth-centered that we forget that, 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 Wisdom is something you can't help accumulating. Everybody tries not to accumulate it in a certain way because it comes from experience, <laughs> but you can't help accumulating it. And, and you know, each of my books, The Emperor of Ocean Park, there was Aunt Alma. You know, I, I, I think about characters who are kind of repositories of wisdom, people to whom one can go for advice. And I really believe in that. I think it's something that if young people today took advantage of the wisdom in the communities around them, the people who've seen things and done things. And people, as young people don't think, ah, you, nobody's ever, you know, you ever see West Side Story? The West Side Story, there's that scene in the uh, candy store when the guy runs the candy store, says to one of the kids, he says, why, when I was your age, and the kid cuts him off, remember? He says, when you was my age, when your old man was my age, when my old man was my age, none of you was ever my age, and the sooner you learn that, the better, he says. And I think that a lot of kids, they really believe that. that that's, that's their worldview. And it's true. No one who is older than anyone today was ever their age now in this world, but that's not the same as saying there's no wisdom out there. And so there's that aspect um, uh, as well, just that sense of wanting to celebrate the idea of wisdom. And I want to talk about wisdom. I forgot the first part of your question. Oh, mystery, John. Why did I do mysteries? Thank you. Um, I don't know exactly why I'm attracted to it, but, I, but if you notice, a lot of lawyers and also law professors when they turn to fiction, turn to mysteries and thrills. And I have a theory about why that is. Now, there may be some lawyers present, so pardon me, but why, you ever wonder why everybody hates lawyers? I'm going to tell you why you hate lawyers. You do want something really simple. You're watching, you know, a TV show, and then he says, you know, the first step in your financial future is to write a will. So you go to your lawyer and say, I'd like to write a will. And lawyers say, have you thought about this? Have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? Have you thought about that? And he goes, this long list of things that are never going to happen to anybody. But your lawyer wants you to think about those things because the people who teach lawyers, us, law professors, from the first day of law school, that's what they learn. That whatever answer they think they've got, we've got 15 hypotheticals, but have you thought about this? Have you thought about this? Have you thought about this? That's how lawyers think. The one kind of training that lawyers have in thinking that most people lack is thinking about contingencies. What might happen in particular? What might go wrong? Well, isn't that what a thriller is? It's the end of the chapter, now what could go wrong? You know, and Laura says, I've got it, I've got it, you know, and, and, just, and just goes on for the next horrible thing to uh, happen. So I think that's why uh, at least many lawyers are attracted to that uh, genre and have been for a very long time, I may guess. Other question? Yes, right there, in the back. Have you ever considered writing short stories? Have I ever considered writing short stories? Not only have I considered that I've written short stories, none of them are ever any good. That's the, that, that's the problem. Um, but uh, although I have one now, a short story I'm actually working on that I have some high hopes for so that we'll see. You see how long my novels are, you know. This one's 500 pages. The last one was 600 pages. Those are getting shorter. So, you know, a certain number of years, I may get down to short story uh, uh, size. Um, I wrote short stories when I was in high school and college. Uh, I wrote some short stories that were published in, like, the high school and college magazines, things like that. But um, that's really all. I've always thought... I've always heard it said that serious writers should publish long novels and short stories. People used to say that. And I've got, I've got some long novels. Um, now I've got to figure out how to do the short, uh, the short uh, stories. And then maybe I can think of myself as a serious uh, uh, writer. Other questions? All the way on the end there, yes. Oh, good. 
Yeah. Now, don't say anything that's going to give anything away about the story. No, I, Okay. No, you did. You, you really did. Story. No, no, I mean, I, I, I don't want you <laughs> to give anything away the story for the audience. Oh, you don't. That, that's what I'm saying. Uh, 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 no, no, don't say anything else. Don't say anything else. You're making a mistake here. Why did you bring it back as president of the university? And then secondly, how much research did you do? Did you get a lot of, uh, you know, uh, there was a lot of, uh, of chess analysis, yeah. a lot of uh, background on chess. Mm-hmm. There was a lot of background on vineyards, which I don't know if you've seen um, Mr. Club Nelson's work, but, you know, he did a documentary on that. And, and did you, were you familiar with that? Um, the first part of the question, why did I bring Lamaster Carlyle back? Because the only thing I can say about that is that there are a lot of characters I wanted to bring back, and all I can say is what I said before, that, that his story seemed to work. Why did I make him president of the university? It just it, it, it felt like it would be an interesting story. That's, that I, I can't you – know, they say that writers are the worst people to describe the uncreative processes, and I, so that's why I sound so inarticulate when I try to do it. But I, that's all I can say is that it seemed like it would work. That's, that's all I can say about that. I do do a lot of research, and I'll tell you why I think I do a lot of research. I'm trained as a scholar, and that means that my protection ordinarily is the footnote. When I write a nonfiction book or I write a nonfiction article, say, for a scholarly journal, I've got footnotes, and if somebody thinks I got a fact wrong, I can point them to my source. Now, maybe the source was mistaken, or maybe I misread the source, but if the dispute is over a point of fact, I don't feel my ego is on the line, and so I've often changed things in later editions of a book, issued corrections of articles. I'm not... You know, I'm I'm not wedded to these facts. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Uh, That's part of the scholarly interchange. But with fiction, I'm making it up. And so if somebody says, I don't think LeMaster would say that, or I don't think Julie would have gone walked through that door or something, you know, I can't say, well, look at the footnote. It really happened (laughs) that way. And, And so the parts that I can control, I work really, really hard to get right. I'm not saying I do get them right, but I work really hard. So, yes, in the Amber Ocean Park, um... So, for example, the Ambrosian Park, we're told twice that um, Misha's wife and son almost died as the son was being born. And, yes, I did research, and, yes, I also even interviewed an obstetrician to make sure I got as many details of the particular thing that happened during the birth right. Um, chess. I do play chess. I'm a chess player of probably average strength. I didn't know much about chess problems before I wrote uh, that book, but I did correspond over a period of time with the person who then wrote the column on chess problems for Chess Life, the magazine of the U.S. Chess Federation, in order to school myself about that. In the excerpt from New England White that I read you tonight, there's a discussion of Julia's interest in antique mirrors. I don't know anything about mirrors, antique or otherwise. I had to research and learn that to try to get those details um, right. And, and it's just important to me, even though, you know, suppose I got the stuff wrong about it. And I may have mistakes, as it is. Suppose I was wrong about something about antique mirrors. You know, 99.99% of people won't even notice, but that one person is going to write me a letter, you know. And, and I know how that feels because I was reading a thriller a few years ago. Nothing to do with the story. I was reading this thriller, and there was a character there, and, and the, the, the author was trying to show how smart the character was. And he said he went to Yale Law School where he was editor-in-chief of the Yale Law Review. There is no such publication as the Yale Law Review. Harvard has a law review. Penn has a law review. Emory has a law review. Everybody's got a law review except Yale, where it's called the Yale Law Journal. Now, it didn't have anything to do with the story, but it brought me up short because it was wrong and I noticed it. It's maybe silly, but that one reader out there who knows mirrors or knows chess problems, I don't want to be brought up short. So I do do a lot of research about things that I can control. I recognize there's probably mistakes. I'm sure I don't get everything right, but I try to get the other aspect of the story right since I can't control, um, since, since I can't say that the parts that are fiction are right. They're just the way it seemed to me would make uh, would make sense. Okay, yes, ma'am. More questions because we have plenty of time for it. Fine. Okay, right here. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm so thrilled to be here. Whenever I go there, we first met you when we were doing history of the work of Julie, and you were just released from Israel. Uh, Thank you. 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 Thank you.
as far as I know, he was just there to get his book signed. <laughs> um, seriously, uh, the movie end of the business, something I don't know much about or, or pay much attention to. My agent says the thing you do with movie rights is you take the money and run. And so we, we sold, no, seriously, because sold the movie rights, for example, to the Amber Ocean Park many years ago. And they had a screenwriter, and I had dinner with him. We had a lovely time. We talked on the phone a number of times. He wrote a screenplay. I said, do you want to do the screenplay? I said, no, um, because I don't think about screenplays. I don't think about filmmaking. I'm a consumer of films. I go to the movies. I know what I like you know, or don't like. Um, but I wouldn't, all I would do is sit there the way authors who get involved, I'd always just get upset and say, why are they doing this? Why are they doing that? And the discipline is to know that that's not my, uh, uh, my world. Will these, move, will these come to the, this, the screen one day? Well, Hollywood buys a lot of books for the screen, and most of them never make it to the screen. Will these make it? Write, write letters, demand it. Maybe they will. I don't know. <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see what, uh, uh, what happens. I'm totally have time for one more. You're going to have the last question right there. Yeah. Am I ever resembling, I mean, I'm sorry, am I ever, do I ever discover when I write my characters, I have to pull back because they're resembling too much people who exist? That's an interesting question. Um, you know, it's funny. Um, somehow, I, I'm, I'm not, I, I, no matter how you ask the question, I'm thinking of not the characters' natures, but their names. So, for example, um, Misha's good friend at the law school uh, in the Ambrosia Park is a woman named Dana Worth, and some of you might remember her. So no sooner does the Ambrosia Park come out, I get a letter from a woman, and she says, Dear Professor Carter, my son, Dana Worth, is an undergraduate at Yale where you teach. <laughs> so remember that one. And then, um, and Vanessa's best friend in New England White is, is a peculiar young woman named Janine Goldsmith. No sooner, the book hadn't even come out yet. The book was just in galleys that had gone to reviewers and bookstores. I get a letter Dear Professor Carter, my name is Janine Goldsmith, and I understand that in your novel, so on and so on and so on. You know, so I, I have that problem with names, but I guess every author has uh, that. Indeed, there's one famous story, some of you may know it. I'm not going to mention the names of a, of a very well-known novelist who was recently accused of using the name of a character to settle a score in one of his novels. Someone had written, this, this was a, a novelist who writes fiction as well as nonfiction, and someone had written a very nasty um, an attack on one of his made desertful, I know I hadn't read it, on one of his nonfiction pieces. And so in his next novel, he put a character with that guy's name, with like two letters different, who was like, he was a pedophile or something, I can't remember, it was something, no, no, I really, you know, and, and so there, there's that. But no, um, I really, I, I try not to resemble other people, and I don't usually feel that way, and yet, after the novel comes out, there are always people think, well, this is really so and so, this is really so and so, this is really so, or this is really me. You know, I don't mean me, I mean the reader, you know, this is, and things like that. That's unavoidable. I'm happy to write characters who seem lively enough and, and fully formed enough that people would think that they could be real people. Because a lot of fiction, the characters are, are sufficiently thin. That, uh, that you don't really get that, that, um, uh, that feeling. So I'm, I'm very happy that people feel that way, but I try to avoid it. I, I try to make sure that it's not really like someone else. And I'll give you one example. So um, uh, the Emperor Ocean Park comes out, and people say to me, oh, well, Judge Oliver Garland is obviously based on Clarence Thomas or something like that, because why? Well, he's a conservative blank judge, therefore he must be. Clarence Thomas, but it strikes me the world is larger than the people whose names you read in the headline, and there's room for a little more complexity than that kind of direct uh, uh, modeling, and I thought the two of them couldn't be more, uh, more different. In any case, thank you for your kind attention. Thank you for coming out tonight.